Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Now, throughout this episode, we will be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. Today, we are honored to be sitting down and chatting with Councillor Ben Fideyev of the Municipal District of Bonneville, Alberta. But before we jump into that interview, we want to say that we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires both dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page on the Cross Border Interviews website. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content that you have come to expect from us. Now, on to our interview with Councillor Fadeev. Ben, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start our interview off with the same question I've asked every single municipal leader who's ever come on my show. So you're no exception to that first question. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Ben? Sense of duty. Wow. I, I never, ex never expected myself to be in this position ever. Uh, basically, just community involvement. Um I'm a business owner in Coal Lake. I have been for a while and I joined a chamber. Uh, it's one of those things where, you know, if you want to make some changes, you uh, just keep your mouth shut and actually jump in, So, which which I did. Uh, being a, being an active member, I uh, then I got into the, the vice vice role. Then I then I chaired the uh, the chamber as uh, right now I'm, 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 I'm past president. And I've always seen a disconnect between the, uh, the city of Coal Lake and the MD of Bonneville. So uh, uh, talking to the leaders back and forth and the uh, past councillor of the MD of Bonneville uh, suggested that I be a, a great councillor. So scratch my head. I'm thinking, you know, time commitment. Can I, you know, can I do it? Uh, I talked about it with my wife because I knew it was going to take some time away from, from my business. And uh, she gave me the go ahead, gave me the green light to do it. And I did. Uh, it's like everything else I do, I jump into both feet, which was, uh, yeah, my time commitment that I thought was, I was going to get into it to what it actually is was <laughs> totally different. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it is it is what it is. And I'm, I'm happy to be in this position. And I got a lot of things that I wanted to get off my checklist done. And I'm uh, I'm pretty happy with that. So from from what I can surmise, in 2017 is the first election you put your name forward for municipal office. Uh, you talk about, you just talked about in your opening statement there that the former councillor or then councillor said that you should put your name forward. Had you consider it prior to that 2017 election or was politics something that was so far off your radar, like many other people I talked to municipally, that when someone finally did approach you to say you should, that's when you ultimately started to think about it? 100%, 100%. I, I never, I you know, being uh, being in the chamber, I mean, I always had a, uh, a a pretty good connection with what was happening in municipalities, based on you know what was happening with their budgets, how things were going, because you know our our uh, our stakeholders had a lot of interest in it. So I always kind of was in touch with it. I kind of knew what was going on, but uh, that is about it. Uh, never you know never thought of it uh, at all uh, until that point. Uh, so I thank you, Mister Bamber. <laughs> Thank you so much. I want to go back to that 2017 election for a second here, because from your background, and I did a little bit of a deep dive on you because I wanted to learn a little bit about you, it seems like you would have had a pulse on your community. You kind of would have known as a, a, someone who was active in the chamber of what was going on in your community. But when you go and door knock and go talk to people at their doorsteps and ask them about the issues that they're uh, confronted with, you can sometimes get an eye-opening experience. When you were door knocking and talking to your uh, fellow neighbors in 2017, were you surprised at some of the issues that you were confronted with when they were talking to you? Uh, not really. Uh, I mean, you know, crime, like real crime was a, was, was huge. Uh, I had to actually go on to the, uh, the local uh, site where, you know, the rural crime site, just to let them know that I'm door knocking 
uh, I do not want anything from you except for your vote. Uh, you know, I have a white truck, uh, it's regular cab, GMC, uh, you know, and, and the fortunate part and the unfortunate part is a lot of people did not answer their doors. Uh, so there, there was a real, uh, real, I guess, a sense of fear with the things that were going on. We also have to remember right, right at the same time, uh, the oil uh, was down. We were at we we're at the worst point, so crime was kind of going up, but well, not kind of going up, but was going up. And uh, yeah, most most of the things were were pretty good, uh, kind of what I thought it was. But but the real crime part was and still is an issue. So we're going to talk about some of the issues later on in the interview, but I want to stick on you for a second and the role of a counselor. Now, you've been in the position now for just over six years, uh, elected in 2017, re-elected in 2021, and now you are two years into your second term mandate. Looking back six years ago, is it what you expected? Is is being the counselor of your community what you expected it, it, compared to what you thought it was going to be six years ago? Uh, you know, working with different boards, I I, I did not. Uh, there is a whole element to politics. Uh, <laughs> the, the the politics within politics is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> good, good say, and bad. Say it ain't <laughs> so, Ben. Come on, politics and politics. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, so it, it's you know, yeah, it's you. You know, one thing I I didn't expect is is uh, you know. Uh, the war driven type of uh you know campaigns that 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 people have which i get right uh but coming from different boards my training was a lot different where we look after the whole community we look at after you know what's best for uh for the whole i guess the uh the organization okay. itself so Is that yeah hard? you know I apologize to jump in there because I can imagine you're elected by Ward 6 residents, but you're not sworn in as MD of Bonneville, uh, number 86, Ward 6 counselor. You're sworn in as the MD counselor. So you have to look at every issue as a community issue, not a ward issue. But you Correct. can't forget about the people who have elected you. So how do you balance that aspect of the job being knowing that you have to go back to your residence and say, I've advocated as much as I can for you, but I have to look at every issue as a bon uh, MD issue, not just a Ward 6 issue. Correct. I mean, you know, you're, that's where, you know, your strap planning comes in and, and, and your strong leadership on your, your reef side and, and, and all of that part of it. Uh, I think that is the, the key of it and, and the core of, uh, of good governance is a, is a plan. Uh, and, you know, and as a plan together as a as a council uh, and i think that's where some of the challenges you know do come in is it hard to stick up for your area when you know that at the end of the day you have a limited supply of money and sometimes ward six may not get their fair share quote quote unquote here fair share yeah. of the municipal budget um, um, unfortunately ward six has been on the short end of the stick for quite a while so uh, they didn't expect too much, uh, but uh, you know, at the end of the day, is uh, you know we you know you know one thing you know we were pushing for is uh, is I guess community engagement. Uh, one thing that we're you know we're we're very proud out of is uh, is you know our, how we maintain our uh, our community halls and like and all that and and uh, uh, the sense of community is is community. So each each one of our when most of our wards we have a uh, like community hall in our organization an ag society that's there, uh, and you know once you're once you tap yourself into that ag society or that hall you really get the pulse of of uh, of what's happening there. Uh, you know it was uh, our area didn't want trails didn't want all that stuff but their uh, their rink was falling apart. Uh, and it, it, you know, a lot of people used it. So uh, with with council at the time, we, you know, we looked at our busiest hamlets, and uh, we decided to uh, spend some money on there to actually put some some legacy money into those uh, those, I guess you know, higher population hamlets. So we uh, went to 
Ardmore and Cherry Grove, and uh, we spent you know, just a little over a million dollars to put a an outdoor NHL size rink in. Uh, so not that you know the stuff was falling apart. They it was built by volunteers 30, 40 years ago with a bunch of two by fours, a bunch of plywood. They put it all together, and it was just falling apart. So you know us spending the money into it. You're looking at a uh, you know something that's going to be there for the next 40, 50 years. And something that is is not going to cost uh, the society any kind of money for maintenance because everything is built out of aluminum and metal and everything else, and that's the drain. It's not the uh, structure; it's the maintenance part of it. So uh, we, you know, we did that, and it's, it's it's been fantastic. You know, we we see things from you know weddings, uh, all season weddings in there to, you know, obviously the hockey part of it, uh, but you know, uh, just concerts. Uh, just everything that's being used in those in those uh those rings is just it's phenomenal and I love it. I I want to turn to sort of a weird a weird part of the show now, and I want to talk because you just talked about engagement, and I, I I I when I when I hear that word, I pick up on it right away because I've got to know. Do you find that there is an apathy when it comes to municipal governance in your community? Do people understand what is going on at City Hall or at Town Hall and they are willing to give their feedback to you? Or are they just looking for that engagement part saying, okay, we want to volunteer within our own community and not give feedback on the day-to-day minutia of what's going on at Town Hall because we've elected Ben to do that. We've elected elected council to do that do you see that there is an apathy when it comes to uh the day-to-day issues that are going on in your community or are people willing to give their feedback to you somewhat when it involves them it does otherwise yeah. you know they're they're busy they're busy they have their you know uh two three kids and a dog and a white picket fence that they have to repaint you know they're, they're busy doing them and so, you know, so they get involved in their community and now to get involved in politics is just, it's just something that I think a lot of people don't have time for. I mean, there's the odd person that, you know, does follow you all the time and, and ask you, you run into Sobeys and all of a sudden it's like, hey, uh, you know, I, I seen you were on this board. What's happening over there? What's happening at FCSS or what's happening at the library? And you're like, wow, uh, didn't know you were that interested <laughs> Does, does that make your job harder, though, when people aren't sort of engaging with the political side of what's going on at the, in this in the community? Because you have to make decisions on a regular basis, and sometimes you want to sort of engage with your residents, I'm assuming, and talk to them about where you think they or where they think this, uh, the community should grow. When you go out asking for feedback, are people willing to give it? Uh somewhat if they answer the phone no, i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> or answer the door <laughs> no, it's it's they do you know and 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 our, like our communications end of it they've done a great job with you know putting stuff out there on on the rural review it's it's a it's a it's a monthly magazine we send out uh you know we're very active on facebook so we do do a, a good job is trying to get uh people to engage but again it's one of those things where people don't seem to want to engage until it's 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 an issue that hits home uh you know to them uh our like our budget you know we've um uh, we've done a little road tour and uh you know you'll go to one community and you'll get not a single person to come vote for the budget and then you go to another community hall and all of a sudden you know you'll have you'll have 20 out there uh so it's it's it is different um it's just all all what uh what might hit them in the, the pocketbook or services, uh, which it's a tough balance on, uh, on the, like on councilors and council, uh, especially nowadays, right? Oh, I want to talk about some of the tough de- decisions for a second, if that's okay, because in six years' time, I'm assuming you've had to make some very tough decisions, uh, whether that be budgetary issues, that whether it be that service levels issues, or whether that be uh, paving even infrastructure issues, you've had to make some very tough decisions at the end of the day. 
And you have to sort of balance out the needs of the community with the individual because you have to make sure that everyone feels like they're getting their fair share of what they're paying in taxes. How do you make the tough decisions as a counselor to ensure that everyone feels like there's something in it for them? But at, at, at the end of the day, people people often forget that uh, you as a counselor uh, are a rate payer as well. So You don't say. <laughs> like, I, I've never people, heard that before. <laughs> people, people were like, oh, yeah, this, I'm like, really? Like, this totally affects me. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, you know, on my... My kids are here. My families are. My businesses are in the, in in Cold Lake. But yet, I mean, we're we're all affiliated together, and of course, they affect me. Uh, it is it is uh, more you know once the tough. This is our toughest budgets. Now you're looking at wants versus needs, uh, and and it's it's pretty easy for me to look at that as a, as a, as a business owner. Uh, we've had to make those tough decisions for a long time now. So. For me, looking at on, on on the budget side of things, it's it's pretty easy. Uh, you no, know, that's a want, uh, not a need. Uh, you know, and just we just move it to the side, and it's easy to tell our like our ratepayers. You know, in order to maintain our, our low level increases in taxes, this is where we have to be at. Uh, I mean, the downloading from I'm sure this is probably the first time you actually heard this that the downloading from the provinces is just keeps on going. Uh, you don't is, say. <laughs> this is this has been our toughest budget ever so we're 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 we have a good management team and uh our ceo uh, you know and, and our asset management we're not looking at what we have now it's also maintaining and trying to uh, alleviate the pains going on onto later so I'll just give you an example right now or um one of the downloads is, is bridges and we're not the only ones in like in the province our next ten-year window on, on on bridges is ninety million dollars for the next ten years. Ninety, nine zero. I think that is the total budget of what the province wants to give out. Uh, you know, there's no fifty-fifty split. They they came out with these these service levels back in the fifties and sixties, where you know they came in, they built all these bridges. And slowly, they were grabbing their, I guess, uh, their part of ownership, you know, 20%. They used to fund 80% of it. Now they, you know, for a while there, they funded 50% of it. Now they don't at all. Uh, so, you know, talking to talking to the ministers, asset management is going to be a huge part of this. So if you want to apply for a, a, a bridge, you have to have half the money of not all of it sitting in that bridge fund. Uh, I mean, it's just, it is impossible. Uh, you know, again, you know, there are, are uh, um, like drilling memorandum, sorry, the drilling tax, you know, we still have another year to go out of that. That's taking a big part of it out. Uh, it's just, uh, yeah, you know, going from the NDP now to, to the UCP, is is one is any of them better? I don't know. Downloading hasn't stopped. I uh, breaking news. Downloading is bad. Um, yeah, but I've got to sort of pick up on that because I I need to play a little bit of devil's advocate with you here for a second, Ben. And I think you're ready for this question. And it's a political question. Uh, uh, understandable. There are needs and wants of every community. Understandable, $90 million is a massive price tag. But if you go to the province and you ask people ask the province for money, there's only one taxpayer at the end of the day, and they're going to be getting it from your residents as well. And that usually means that their portion of the mill rate will go up. Or their portion of the property taxes will go up, and they will get a portion of that, the province. So how do you do this in the short term? How do you ensure the continuous growth, the continuous success of your community when you understand that the financial realities that we currently live in means that if you ask the province, they're going to come from the taxpayers. If you do it yourself, it's going to be on the backs of the taxpayers. How do you do that? How does you, how do you, in your role as counselor, envision working for the betterment of the community while understanding you can't do it fully on the backs of the taxpayer. hundred percent. And that's what I kept 
that's what I keep telling uh, the people at the government of Alberta is there, you know, there really is only one taxpayer. Uh, you know, they're, they're still making their money off of royalties, which is fair, but they've also, they, they give these, these concessions to uh, the industry based on the backs of the municipalities, not on the backs of the government. So, so the government's still making their money. And yes, I mean, congratulations on paying off $5 billion net. Uh, but that, uh, that, that debt has been paid for on the backs of municipalities. We have had to cut our, or, you know, cut, I guess, some of the services. I mean, we, the MD Bonner, we are having a real time, real tough time cutting services. <laughs> so, but anyways, uh, you know, you know, like those are some of the challenges. And you know what? It's, uh, the British file scares me. Uh, you know, I, I, I wish I was a uh, seasoned counselor when I first started. I would have pushed maybe to put some more money into asset management. Asset management was talked about, but not at this level. Uh, you know, getting back to uh, you know mill rates, kind of what you talked about. Uh, the government has you know has always uh, wanted to go to that five to one rate. Uh, a lot of municipalities like ours, where a lot of our money, close to, we kind of bounce around that seventy six to eighty percent of our money comes from from industry. Uh, when you start clawing back to two to five to one, uh, so does your funding, uh, you know, and, and also, you know, it's, it's people think, well, you, you're still making lots of money. Look at your budgets, 120 million, 130 million. But you know what? We have 2,700 kilometers worth of roads. Uh, you know, when, and when you, when you're looking at, at the cost increases, you know, you're talking about, you know, inflation and it's 6% and it's 5% and it's 3%. Like BS to that, you know, when, when you're looking at a road and, you know, for a mile of road, you know, before it was roughly one, one, one point two million dollars to do a, uh, uh, like a rebuild and a, and a pave. We just got a quote here two months ago at three point two million bucks. So tell me, where, where's the seven percent? Come on. Like, it's just it is it is it is frustrating. Uh, and, and, you know, and people, rate bears just don't see that. They don't see the, the huge increases. Uh, you know, I mean, our, uh, our operational end of it, you know, just, just to do business has increased to four to five million bucks. Uh, so our operations part of it has gone up. Our, our, our money coming in has gone down. And that's, that's not a good position to be at. Uh, I've, I've been there as a business. Uh, it's not fun times, you know. Uh, you just just make do with what you do until you hope that that thing's going to change. And uh, where is it at? I I really don't know. Had a good talk with uh, with, with Minister Horner about that. Uh, you know, there while you were there, I seen you running around. I, I went up to the mic and I'm asking the question. They ran around my question, and I uh, they, they give you a complete different answer than what your question is. So I had a chance the, to. The uh, best thing about politics, it's, remember, it's question period. It's not answer session. Remember that. Then <laughs> come on, you should know that. And it's bear session. It's not. Sure. I'm going to actually answer the question that was asked. Session. Hundred percent. So I, I according to Mister, you know, Mister Horner, and and you know, I kind of had a chat, and he's like, you know, I said, you totally misunderstood my question. He goes, no, I didn't. I'm like, okay, well, there's an honest guy. So he he danced around it, but you know. He asked me, well, how would you do this? I says, I'm asking for you guys to, to increase the taxes on the industry. I'm just saying is quit giving them the concessions. Uh, you know, like, like industry as well as, as labor force has a, have asked the municipalities as a whole to make this, to make our area a better place, to make our area a place where you're not sentenced to. Uh, you know, oh, sh okay. Sorry, I was going to use the S word, but oh crap! I'm going to, uh, you know, to Coal Lake, or I'm going to Bonnie, or to the MD. At the end of the world, you know, I, how am I going to keep my family happy here? And I'm not going to be, you know, so all that, all that kind of stuff. Same with the military. Uh, so the military can apply to not go to this area because it's it's too far away and it's a burden on their family. And it, you know, and then they get put onto the, I don't, 
I, I, I'm shocked at they that. Drop I, I, I did not know that the military, which is usually you get told what to do, can say, no, no I don't want to go there. No, wow. No, 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 no. Of, of course, you got to remember it's uh, not political at all, but uh, it's the liberal way. Uh, anyways, uh, so, I, I, so, I want to, uh, I have one last question in this segment before I turn to my next one. I gotta <laughs> let that, I'm just gonna let that linger for a few seconds who are listening to Ottawa right now, who are listening to this in Ottawa. Um, at the beginning of this interview, you you talked about the one of the reasons why you got involved municipally, and it was to bridge the gap and bridge the relationship between Cold Lake and the MD of Bonneville. And you saw it as a, at a chamber level, and now you have been in the office for six years. I'm going to ask the very political question because I'm hoping to get someone on from Cold Lake to ask this follow-up question with them as well. How has that relationship building gone gone like for you? And has it mended to the point where you're happy with the progress you've made in six years? You know, uh, there's always, all, you know, there's always work. Like, you can always be better, 100%. Has it, uh, you know, I think it's gone drastically better than all than, than it ever has. Uh, you know, again, you know, it's, it's, uh, I'm involved in my community. I'm always here. You know, my, my kids go to the Coal Lake High School. My businesses are here. I always see the counselors. We always have a, uh, you know, positive conversations and we try to do things together. Uh, on, on, on a tourism part of it, uh, you know, as we kind of talked about, is you can't just look at a, you know, what does the MD of Bonneville, like Bonneville going to do for tourism? It's it's a regional thing because, you know, uh, as, as a region, uh, with the MD, if we spend a pile of money in tourism, the benefits are going to go to city or to town. That's where they have the hotels. You know, we don't have any of that. So it it, it is truly it is a it is a partnership thing, and I think we do a great job with the with the city of Coal Lake and the town of Bonville uh, with that. So I want to turn to the second segment now because I'm cautious of time and I want to ask uh, a question. But before I do, as I always do, I'm going to preface this by saying this is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council, not a direction of council, not even a policy of council, because the councillor I'm speaking to is only one vote of his council. So, councillor, in your opinion and your opinion alone, what do you see as the biggest issue or issues facing the municipal district of Bonneville today? We kind of talked about it before. It is, uh, it's funding, it's it's money. Uh, you know, again, when 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 you know that the high seventies to eighty percent of our money comes from from industry. Uh, you know, we got to be cognizant of of that uh, you know how do we how do we slowly pivot how do we slowly pivot into getting you know another source of you know, like revenue to come in uh, and and how do we uh, how do we bring down our service levels without uh, impeding what our residents want without getting growth stunted uh, to, to a point right uh, so we you know we have to be uh, careful of that. We are trying to do that. Uh, you know, the I see great opportunities with uh, uh, like with the base coming in. You know, I mean, they're they're going to be spending piles of money, like multi millions of dollars. Their first phase, second phase. I mean, they're I think in the next ten years they'll be. I think it's be over a billion dollars of spending. Uh, you know, everybody's going to be looking at uh, you know at this you know at the pathways project, and they're like, oh, it's going to be sixteen point five billion dollars going to be coming into your area. Yeah. You know what? <laughs> let's see the let's see the side documents first, right? Uh, I mean, it's it's a big project, and when you have uh, three types of governments uh, that have that have influence on it, and you have uh, six big dogs in it, uh, as far as energy companies go, uh, yeah, it's it's there's going to be some challenges. I think their their goal is to do it all together, and I think you know we just had a meeting with uh, with. Uh, with them here, you know, a couple three weeks ago, and it's very positive, and they're trying to do their best, and uh, I, I think it's you know we're going to get there, but it's going to be influenced by the you know, it's called by the feds, uh, you know, the feds are you know are being lobbied all the time. Uh, we we think of carbon capture as you know to be only an oil 
product or an oil issue, but it's not. It's you know the you know the cement industry down in down east is huge. Uh, their lobby efforts are big. Uh, you know, especially when you're dealing with with Quebec. Uh, so, you know, when when they're in the Fed's ears all the time, uh, you know, are we as well? Absolutely, right. So. Uh, we, we, you know, we need that step forward uh, with pathways to to give, give the oil industry somewhat of a uh, of a positive shine, uh, being being carbon neutral. Uh, I think that's what we need. You know, we are we are the most ethical uh, producing you know oil in in the, in the world, and I think we need to keep we need to keep uh, pounding that drum and getting the message out. Uh, a lot of people in Ontario and, and, and Quebec, you know, don't realize our issues are the same as their issues, uh, and and they think of you know of our oil as you know, the tar sands. Uh, people have no idea. Even down south, people have no idea. I met this one guy that he called it the tar sands, and <laughs> I got this big vein here to start throbbing. I'm like, I'm like, dude, where are you from, Alberta? I'm like, what? I says, oh. Come out, come out! I'll I'll give you a tour of and show you what, what you know what that looks like. You know we're very ethical. The, you know this the the sag deep uh, ish. You know uh, most of the sag deep stuff here is very clean. You know uh, the, the oil in the oil industry plant. You know they they plant more trees and 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 do do better things for the environment than than Greenpeace does. Uh, you know it's it's. Uh, my my you know on a sub, uh, on like on a different subject my my brother in law he, he lives in England uh, as as a young fella he was uh, he was a green piecer and, uh, and and he uh, he came over here he was he was totally blown away but how we live and and, and the things we need to uh, to sustain ourselves uh, and his his he's his whole mind is totally switched and uh, and he, he can't believe how how well are we doing here? You are the first area, first community that I've spoken to. And I've spoken to someone from the regional municipality of Wood Buffalo, but we did not talk about the oil industry. And you've brought it up. So I'm going to play in the sandbox for a little bit here, if, if you don't mind. Absolutely. And I've got to ask a very sort of poignant, political, uh, important question. You have a federal government in Ottawa who is looking at moving away from the oil industry. You have a provincial government who is an advocate for the oil and gas industry. You are a municipality who see, sort of reaps the benefits of the oil and gas industry. And I say that by you get the windfalls. You get people coming in, building houses, doing their work here. Do, uh, explo ex uh, exporting the oil and gas uh, natural resources in your community into different areas. But you have two levels of government who are vehemently opposed against each other right now, and the municipality is stuck in the middle. How do you navigate these waters as a council, as a municipality, to ensure that you know you have to work with both of them, even though they don't want to seem to work together? <laughs> and you know, say it is too bad. It is too bad that the uh, the, the line is drawn uh, so drastically, so deep now, especially with uh, with with uh, with Premier Smith coming out. Uh, it, it it truly is a us against them, and I, I think it's it's wrong. We're not going to get anywhere with you know with that kind of work. What people are forgetting is is the the you know the amount of investment that the Feds do bring into into the West. Uh, I was a part of community futures for uh, for a while, and and you know, them building businesses is done on the back of the feds. Uh, you know, they they are putting money into this. Uh, I think there, you know, there could be a good compromise, uh, but you know, maybe not with this government. Uh, but I think future government it definitely could. I mean, the, I mean, the end of the day, and that's the same conversation I had with uh, Joe Cece when he was here, is uh, you know. Don't be so hard on oil. Don't don't come down so hard on the things here. This is with that money. Yes, you can put out your social programs and everything else, but don't cap them. Uh, and, and you know, fast moving fast forward, they kind of did. But anyways, that's I think it, it, it is a good balance. And I I, I don't I don't uh, 
Do you feel no like the middleman? Do you feel like the middleman, like talking to both governments yeah. and sort of being the Absolutely. middle council level of government that is usually not the middle council, uh, middle level of government because usually municipalities are considered the children of the province. And, you know, and we are. I mean, we're you know we we have this big thick white book, the NG, <laughs> that tells us how to operate. Uh, you know, when, when you'll 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 get councils that. That thing that book you know should be thrown out, but yet in the, the end of the end of the day is they don't realize that you know we are children of the province and you know we have to abide by their rules. Uh, it is tough. It is tough. It is tough to, uh, uh, but I think you know working with the province and uh, getting to do, you know getting them to understand some of our needs is what we can bring to to the table. Uh, some days we feel like. In our area, we feel like the Alberta in in, uh, in the country. Uh, 30 percent of of the the you know like the bitumen dollars come from the NBA body. Meanwhile, we're we are not being looked at for you know any kind of funding from the our highway, which which continues north and south Highway Twenty Eight. Uh, they've you know taken away our rail, uh, so our our main transportation is up and down that highway with the Air Force base being as big as it is, that highway gets used a lot. And, uh, you know, every time I go down south, I see highways going east and west, and they're all looking pretty nice. We come up here, our main main intersection road, the Highway 28, uh, is, is just uh, not being looked at at all. Uh, we pounded pretty hard. Uh, so now they, they gave us a $5 million uh, study. <laughs> so... So we'll, we'll see where that goes. Uh, oh. I think I think uh, you know a lot of people have have stated that uh, high, Highway Twenty Eight is the, uh, the 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 most studied highway in the province. It so, it, it wouldn't so, be a government unless there was a study on Highway Twenty Eight. I don't care who you are, from Smith all the way back to I think Klein. Twenty Eight has always had a study upon study, right? And it's it's you know I mean when you're uh, it it affects everything. It affects tourism to uh, just to basically transportation. Uh, I mean, we're you know we're seeing our you know our issues we have that we're having with with the HS model that people are always having to go down to Edmonton for testing and and all that stuff. So again, you know uh, you know healthcare has has an issue with that. You're always on that road, and when it becomes uh, you know unsafe, you know it's it's sad to see. Right, uh, the problems doesn't want to hear anything about safety they don't want to hear about a death toll they want to hear about economic corridors we've even gone that way and uh it's just it's still we're just being you know kicked down the road and uh it's just yeah we just have to keep on pounding i mean that I, that part of it that part of this job i love i love uh you know bringing uh our issues to the province and, and you know I, I wish i could do a better job uh but uh yeah i mean i think if i was in the position uh, you know uh, to do that on a full time basis, I would love it. Uh, just being down there and whoa, whoa, whoa! whoa. You're you're saying a drum. rural community counselor does not get paid full time <laughs> hours and full time yeah. pay to do your job? I I I, <clears throat> I joke. I joke. I I compl- you you. Smaller urban communities, smaller rural councillors are the unsung heroes of municipal politics because you do as much as uh, your larger urban centres do, but you do it for literally quarter of the pay and full-time hours. So I give you credit on that. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean, you know, again, uh, people don't realize, you know, how much I mean, it's, it is affecting, you know, like my business as itself, right, where, you know, uh, I've pretty well stepped you know, pretty well stepped away from it i'm at you know maybe 90 percent active in one of them uh, a little more active in the other and uh and i i have to because mike i i took the oath i made the commitment to uh, to the md to do the best i can and i'm doing it right now until that uh till that clock uh, stops <laughs> then uh, i'll uh, i'll look at everything else for sure
I, I was recently speaking to a mayor from back in Ontario, uh, I think Quebec, sorry. And he said that uh, with his job as mayor and he works, he, he's on a few organizations as well. He has probably lost money from his business because of all the times that he's spending as a municipal yeah. politician. And I, 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 I'm flabbergasted that that happens in 2023, but at the same time, you you can't go to your uh, community and say we have all these issues so we need to raise our salaries so we can make your life easier is it it's just a double edged sword that is probably unsustainable in any community especially when you ask for a pay raise from your residents um for sure it is right i mean you know some some communities you know uh, hire lobbyists and everything else but that's a slippery slope as well uh when you're you know they'll they'll uh their salesman at the end of the day is, you know, they're looking at, uh, you know, bringing in uh, municipalities for for their organization. Uh, and, you know, what if they can't solve the issue within, you know, uh, two or three meetings with a minister, you think that bothers them? It, it's not going to. We'll just, we'll just keep continuing to punch that clock in and say, yeah, you know what, this lobby effort took us, uh, you know, 10 meetings instead. Right. So uh, I, I will be the first to admit that there is more lobbyists out there in the province of Alberta than there's probably municipal councillors right now. But that's just another oh, guarantee. That yeah, is yeah, a yeah, completely. Yeah. yeah. Road it's, it's, that... it's, 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 it's pretty weird when when, you, you know, I, I did have a, a touch of uh, of a taste of, uh, of federal and provincial politics. I worked for uh, uh, Canadian Federation of, Inde- of Independent Business for a while. And uh, I get to uh, kind of chaperone the, uh, the lobbyist there. And uh, it was fun, but it was also she was working on one file for two years. And uh, she was pounding the pavement hard. And then after two years, they decided to just drop that whole case. So I'm like, two years of work for what? For nothing? <laughs> so, and you know what? Uh, yeah, so it was, I had a little bit of a taste of it. And that was, that was quite a while ago. That was 25 years ago. So, uh, yeah, I forgot to mention that. So I want to turn to my last subject because I'm cautious of time here and we're almost at the 45 minute mark. And I want to talk Ooh. about something. I know this is the great thing about these episodes. I don't think people realize while they're watching it, they're like, oh, it's a half hour, 40 minutes. But when you're talking to somebody, you don't actually realize how long t- time has sort of passed until you look at the clock. And I was like, oh, God, we're almost at the 45 minute mark. And I haven't even asked my favorite question. And you've t- talked about it, touched on it a little bit already. But I want to talk about tourism because I believe tourism is the unsung economic driver of a lot of municipalities. And I don't think municipalities do it quite right. I'm just saying that from a personal experience. but. As I've said on this show, if you come on my show, I am coming to your community. So maybe I will be able to get a tour of the MD with you, counselor, when I'm up there in 2024. But I'm going to ask you this question pointedly. What are the hidden gems in the MD or in the area? Uh, you can you can choose Cold Lake because I, I you you talked about how you can't do tourism with the MD because there's a spillover effect for the communities as well. So, what are some of the hidden gems in your area of Alberta that you think Albertans and Canadians should visit if they ever have a weekend to go up and take a moment and spend it in the MD of Bonneville? Yeah, thank you for that important question. Uh, I mean, it's uh, it is something that we're hoping to you know get in front of the uh, the tour minister. You know, we, we see all this funding uh, going into the core area. Uh, you know, maybe around Banff, maybe around Canmore, maybe around Jasper. And that is it. We're we're slowly starting to see them paying a little bit of attention to this area our, our, our hidden gem is uh, is called it's called canuso ridge canuso ridge is a is a ski hill that we uh, adopted back in the, the mid 70s over the last little while especially the, the last eight years uh, we've put a lot of money into the lodge there uh, in the last two years we actually lo- looked at it as keeping it as a uh, all-around uh, facility so which we have done it is absolutely amazing people are blown away and so will you when you come up here you'll turn a corner and you're like what this is in the md of bonneville uh it is on the shore of of uh, of cold lake 
you know, our, our campground or our, our, our ND campground in Cold Lake is, is, is the best use. We have about 145 units there and about 14 uh, tent stalls. Uh, it's, it's incredible. Uh, you, you know, you go a little bit to the east on a little bit of a walk, you're, you're five, 10 minutes into the, uh, the beautiful uh, Coal Lake Beach, uh, called Canusu Beach. And is it, you know, the city has really uh, made that into a gem. It's, it's considered one of the, you know, I think the top 10 beaches in Alberta. It is, it is absolutely incredible. They put a lot of money into it and, and you can see that. So, uh, so that, that's one of them. You know, our, our like our farm to table is is incredible. Uh, we, we you know we have a lot of uh, good, uh, and I'm going to miss a few of these. these but everyone who's listening farms, to this in the right? MD, who's you're missing, is about to say, "Does he not support me anymore? Like, what did I do?" I know, to right? <laughs> so, Charlotte Lake Farms, where you know they actually, you know, we used their beef at at like at the Ridge at the Ridge restaurant. In a, over at the over at Canusa Ridge, it is phenomenal. They, you know, it's grass fed. There, there's no you know additives put into the. I mean, it is truly it's it, it's amazing. Uh, they have you know, uh, and thanks to Community Futures, we have our farm days, and that's it, you know it's, it's it's right across Alberta, where we bring rural people, rural urban people, into the farms. Uh, we have a we have a great uh, a great. Uh, if you want to get off the beaten path. Just kind of by, by you know by Wolf Lake, we have a, a place called it's called Providence Acres, where you have fl uh, flowers. They have eight hundred and fifty varieties of flowers you can pick. And, you know they they hold they they, they hold about uh, twenty people per you know per day there, and uh, they uh, you know uh, people come there. It's a little bit of a ways away. Uh, but they enjoy the day. They're off the beaten path. You're you're in the sticks. You truly are. It's a you know part of nature. There is something that most people haven't seen in 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 rural. Uh, sorry, in urban urban atmosphere. Uh, we have a place called Three Fifty Farms that that's here that truly bring that unique tenting yurt experience. Uh, you get there. They'll they'll provide you a meal. They'll give you a but the below picnic. Uh, basket to go along and say, go off on your merry way. Uh, here's some of the hot spots in the area, and we'll see you tonight. And people are, you know, people from you know Shore Park, St. Albert, are really enjoying the the quiet, off beaten part. Um, you know, for me, I like we love the mountains. We we go up there all the time. But man, when you're dealing with the traffic and the people and everything else, it is it is uh, it's ridiculous. I'm always happy to come back here. Um, you know what? We really need to uh, focus on uh, bringing people here, like like the staycations. Uh, you know, people aren't weren't traveling down to Mexico and and all those places uh, in, in the years past. I think uh, the Edmonton Journal just had a uh, uh, little bit of an excerpt uh, on a study of uh, where the money is coming from. Uh, the big part of the money where it's coming from is is, is Ontario. Uh, and it's it's amazing to see that we, we you know we think it's going to be somewhere from Europe or you know wherever else, but it, it's not. You know, uh, it's people that are wanting to see the rest of the country. Uh, you know, I, I wish we could. Uh, you know, I wish all municipalities in Alberta would get a sister or a brother county or a town in Ontario where we could uh, you know visit each other on a you know, professional, not professional basis and see what our communities have to offer and, and bring back some, steal some ideas from each other and, uh, and, and do that and kind of maybe bridge that gap. I would, I would love to see that. Well, you heard it here first, everyone. I think that's an amazing idea. And as I have listeners from Ontario, particularly in the municipal right. realm, reach out to Ben. So I have one last question for you before I let you go. And it's the million dollar question that I've asked every single municipal leader because I think they know how to answer it, but I want to put it on the record. And that is, in your opinion, what makes the MD of Bonneville such a unique place to live, work, and raise a family? Uh, you know what? It's uh, just, it's a smaller community. Uh, we, we, good and bad. Um, you know, one you know, one of the stories uh, I kind of share with you. 
uh, is uh, my my kids were walking home from school. Uh, they got to uh, the A and W, which is a couple blocks away from my store. They went on this huge snow pile, and they went slid down it onto the service road. Uh, you know, the car was closed, but it wasn't. My wife got the phone call right away saying, "Hey, what are your kids doing there?" So five minutes later, uh, you know, my kids walked into the door, and my wife goes, uh, "What the heck are you guys doing sliding on a thing?" And they're like, "What?" You know, mom knows everything. Anyways, <laughs> it is it is that that sense of community and a sense of everybody knowing everybody, and it to you know to the good part. Uh, I mean, you know, we we look after after each other, uh, and you know, we 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 all want the best for the area, uh, no matter what our differences in opinion are. Uh, and I think you know, having that communication and that connection, uh, even though we you know we we. We uh, we're very competitive with sports teams, uh, you know. Oh, you're playing those guys. Oh my, you know. Even though they're in community, we uh, as as a you know as a community, we we truly enjoy that. It is it is a friendly, um, active community, and I think that's uh, that's something that I cherish. Uh, and you know, uh, it's it's great. It's great. Ben, I want to thank you. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for doing this. Um, I, I I say this a lot, but I say it with sincerity each time I say it. Um, thank you. Thank you for serving your community. It truly sounds like in the 45 minutes, almost an hour of talking to you, um, you are truly an ambassador for your community. It seems like you have the best interest of your community at heart. You want the best for your community. So you're advocating for your community as much as possible whenever you get the chance to be in front of ministers. So thank you so much for doing this, for sitting down with me, but also thank you so much for being part of your community and for being part of a municipality that is so important to the future of our province in some sense and even our country so thank you so much absolutely but chris you know we gotta we gotta you gotta thank you as well i mean you're <laughs> you're you know you are bringing light uh to uh to the government that faces the people all the time right where you know we're on on, on the provincial side you're maybe in their federal side you know uh stakeholders don't really have any engagement with with them but uh, uh but thank you for bringing some attention to our area uh municipal politics and, and everything else as well. I do appreciate what you do. Thank you for joining us for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential to our mission. Now, as we ramp up, it is my hope that you have gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest today. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with our latest conversations, but you're playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please visit our support page conveniently linked in the show notes or by visiting crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content that you have come to expect from us. Once again, thank you for being part of the Cross Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter in Canada. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.